Hello. Um, we're now in our final, final section of the evening. Because um, it kind of it feels like evening now. Um, so, when I, we first did a full haunted landscape four years ago, um, um, and there were, there were sort of a few inspirations, you know, doing things with the folklore society, having a, having a strong interest in the folklore and spookiness of Britain, Erie, England, and the like. Um, wanting to show other organisations who have the word folk in their in their title how it's done. Um, and uh, also the, the, the writings and talks given by Paul Devereux that I, I, I've read his books and seen him speaking at the 14 Times Unconvention. And partly the, the image that Paul evokes of hooded, shadowy figures processing across the landscape was a, was a real inspiration for uh, putting this thing together in the first place. So um, really, really pleased now speaking on we dare not go a-hunting for fear of little men. Please welcome to the haunted landscape, Paul Devereux. Right, uh, thank you. Uh, hello. Um, I'll be mainly focusing on the way spirits have taken through the landscape, literally causing it to be haunted. And I started the most tangible type of infrastructure and go on through to something that is wholly non-material. Right. First of all, death roads or corpse ways or churchway paths and so on. Unfortunately, most of these uh, are not so well signed as this one, Swindale. Uh, most of them, in fact, are growing back into the landscape, very difficult to find. But a few are prominent, and a few are not too difficult to find. But usually you have to go back to old uh, field maps and so on to really trace where they are. Um, a couple of examples, because we've got to be through fairly quickly. This is St. Levin's Path in uh, Cornwall. Uh, there it goes. Uh, and it le it's actually marked rare, this is rare, uh, by small uh, Celtic crosses that mark its course through the Land's End area. Uh, when it gets to the church, um, the, the coffin, often just a Hessian sack with the corpse in it, is placed on this life-size or death-size stone at the boundary of the churchyard. So you're in no doubt that you're on a, a death road. It was tradition uh, not to, for farmers not to plough over the course of a corpse way. Uh, very bad luck to do that. Leaves revenants wandering all over the place. And this, this excellent example uh, near Brails in Warwickshire, see it cutting through and it's been carefully, studiously left. Uh, and when it comes to the church, which is behind the camera position, you go down these steps and a paved way, just barely visible there. Most famous corpse way is the Lich Way from, on Dartmoor. It leads um, from the centre of the southern part of the moor, and it goes for about 12, 14 miles. Uh, when it gets uh, to the river Tavy, there are these stepping stones, and at this point, the people carrying the, the body will be met by characters who come out of Coffin Wood next nearby, and they would put the, the corpse in a, a makeshift coffin in order to carry it over the river. I mean, there it's all nice and placid, but sometimes it can get pretty rough. Anyway, you go over, you pay off the, the guys, go over the stile, turn to the right, and you go up this lane here, which is known as Corpse Lane, and ultimately get to the Lydney Church, which had the uh, burial rites. And these people living out in farmsteads scattered around Dartmoor 
That was the way they had to take their dead to get a proper Christian burial. There's another example in uh, Lake District. Um, uh, Rydal to Grasmere. Wordsworth lived part of his life in, in Rydal, uh, and he used to walk along this path. It is said this is where he saw the bobbing host of golden daffodils we all learn about at school, and which I've now forgotten, but anyway. He, uh, uh, that, that's, he was walking that path. It's now a recreational path, uh, but as a hint of what its former purpose had been, uh, this is where they used to rest the coffin when they were taking it to the church in Grasmere. They'd all sit there and uh, or stand around and sing hymns and look at the view. Okay, there's the physical stuff, the corpse ways. Okay, uh, a sociologist, social anthropologist will tell you, well, it's how people in remote areas carried their dead to the churches that had the burial rites, which is true. But what happened to these roads, these sort of, they're medieval to early modern, these features, uh, they attracted uh, spirit law, a very ancient form of spirit law. And it was known, oops, it was known in Shakespeare's time, as you can see. Now it is the time of night, the graves all gaping wide. Everyone lets forth his sprite in the churchway paths to glide. He has Puck say that in a Midsummer Night's Dream. So it was known So let's look at spirit ways to step up from those physical roads. The first hint, if you like, that there was a spirit dimension being attached to these corpse roads was in the existence of corpse way seers. Uh, and uh, we know the names of some of them. Old Margaret, she lived at Fry Up. Uh, there's Dandy Dale and Fry Up Dale are parallel, and there's a ridge in the middle. And here you see the, the death road, the old hell way, uh, going over the top of the ridge uh, and leading to uh, St. Hilda's Church, an ancient church. People, uh, the dead who were taken by this route, had a special area allotted to them in the churchyard. Now, old Margaret, uh, these seers, what they could do would see spectral visions of those who were going to die in the parish in the next year or so, uh, and, and, and ghostly cortages walking along, you, walking uh, funerals. Uh, and she, one day, she saw her own wraith. A wraith is not a ghost, of course. A wraith is the spirit of a living person who might be asleep or whatever. Uh, she saw the wraiths of these people, and then she saw her own wraith going along the path. So she warned her neighbours. She said, if I die, and die I will, she said, take me by the old road. And she said, if you don't, I'll return. <laughs> uh, and in fact, in medieval times, there was a tremendous fear about revenants. Uh, anyway, so there's that one. Another example was uh, George Cairns. He was the last known ghost seer at Buckland Newton Church in Dorset. The corpse road uh, to Buckland Newton starts, as far as we could ascertain anyway, at the hamlet of Plush. He goes up and up and over, and then there's part of the pathway going along. And finally goes down across some meadow land. It, it, of course, it's not now visible, but we know where it went. Uh, and he went on through this style. It's a modern style, but there was an old one there. To the church, you can just see the uh, tower through there. That's the course. 
Uh, and this is uh, Death's Door at the church, Holyrood Church in Buckland, Newton. Now, in Holland, there were also uh, death roads. Uh, they called them the Dode Wagen. These were the same as the British Corpse Roads, except they were more strictly maintained. Their width and strain is being checked by officials every year. This one is now maintained as a recreational path near Hilversum. The Dode Wagen were also referred to as spoken wagons, spook or ghost roads, showing that spirit law was indeed attached to them. In any case, we know from contemporary accounts of funerals conducted on the Dode Wagon that it was thought the spirit of the deceased walked ahead of the funeral procession. As in Britain, certain observances were made to ensure that the spirit did not return along the road and haunt the living. Such practices included crossing rivers or streams by stepping stones or over bridges because it was believed the spirits could not pass uh, on their own uh, over running water. And also they passed through crossroads where they could, which was thought to bind spirits. The reason why people were hanged at crossroads or the bodies of suicides buried there. A lot of grim stuff about crossroads. In Holland, corpse wasteers were known as precursors. I'm not going to try and pronounce the, the Dutch. Boy, love, yeah, okay, that'll do. Uh, diviners or seers who, like the others, were uh, used the Dungeon to foresee the impending deaths of parishioners. They claimed to be able to psychically perceive spectral funerals moving along the death roads. The death roads were therefore associated with a system of necromancy. It was a complex, complex and definite link, a definite necromantic tradition. Now, I've written a depth about this in a book probably you've never read. <laughs> okay, moving on through... Uh, we now come to non-physical spirit ways. These are examples uh, of virtual spirit ways. They existed only in the folk mind, but they were thought to have a definite geography. In Germany, for instance, there was a belief in Geisterbecker, invisible spirit paths that connected physical cemeteries. So the cemeteries were in this world but the spirit road between them was not. They were said to run dead straight through the countryside, across mountains and valleys. These invisible routes were said to have the same properties as cemeteries, and ghosts thrived on them. So what this really meant, as, as Richard mentioned in his talk, people um, in medieval times, uh, they, they traveled a lot on foot, they, in fact, I asked one chap in Ireland, why do we not uh, see fairies today? Uh, that was before we actually saw a fairy, and I'll tell you about that shortly. Uh, he said, well, he said, you people, an old man, he said, you people move too quickly through the land. You don't see anything. He said, but we saw plenty. And he said, I could show you paths we took. We walked from one person's house to another. And they, uh, those paths are no longer there. Anyway, a similar idea uh, existed in what is now Russia, Eastern Russia. In Neman, for instance, one was not allowed to build tall structures on a straight line between two cemeteries in the city so as not to obstruct ghosts flitting from one to the other. This invisible line connecting the cemeteries was known, roughly translated, as the corpse flight path. Lichen Flugbahn. It had a name. And you didn't put, if you put up fences, they were torn down, things like that. 
I mean, this really happened. You know. In Brittany, in Albania, in indeed most lands across Europe, the dead were believed to have their own special roots through the physical landscape. And in Brittany and in uh, the Channel Islands, sometimes the roads, spirit roads of, of the dead uh, and fairy paths got mixed up. Interesting, come to that in a minute. So the, perhaps the ultimate example of invisible spirit paths are fairy paths uh, or elemental paths, whatever you want to call these things. Uh, unfortunately, they are not signposted. Uh, fairies go in a straight line, gliding, as it were, within a short distance of the ground, said Patrick Kennedy in 1870. Notice this thing about straight lines. Straight lines and spirits movement are synonymous. Fairy routes were invisible, but had geographical reality for the country folk. They were thought to connect wraths, a type of prehistoric, uh, and uh, medieval and early modern earthwork, often referred to as fairy forts. The courses of these invisible paths were marked by such features as old hawthorn bushes, rocky outcrops, small lakes or pools, and prehistoric sites. If a house was built on a fairy path, it was said to be in the way or in a contrary place, or in a path. And the inhabitants would have bad luck, illness, or be haunted by troublesome spirits. So in Ireland, there were specific building rules to try to prevent this happening. And some of those rules, I'm throwing a pure speculation at you here, I haven't been up to now, but a speculation is that I think it's all part of the same Eurasian deep-seated law about spirits and spirit travel that you'll find popping up in um, Feng Shui, for example, the secret arrows in the landscape coming up to your door and you have to fend them off. The picture there shows uh, Liasard, the fairy fort, Kilty Ma, County Mayo. Very famous and lots and lots of folklore about it. <coughs> okay, my turn to show a book or two. Uh, unfortunately, because I'm such a wonderful salesman, you can't buy these books anymore. They're out of print. Uh, I think you, it's Fairy Pass and Spirit Rose came out in 2003, and another edition came out in 2007, just called Spirit Rose. I think you can get that one still from. Amazon or a second-hand book uh, seller. <coughs> it's terrible. It's printed on loo paper, and uh, it's not good. Uh, but the other one is high quality, um, if you can get your hands on one. Now, I wanted to study the geography of fairy paths, many different types of spirit paths, and that book covers a whole lot from Australia and Germany and Holland all over. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and uh, the thing is, how do you start studying fairy paths? Well, we found out. Oh, it's okay now. We found out that uh, University College Dublin, UCD, held the documentary results of something that happened in the 1930s. Uh, called the Schools Project, and this involved uh, schools across Ireland asking their kids to go and talk to the oldest member of their family or extended family and ask them for their stories, their folklore, if you like. These were collected. They came back to U UCD and various other places, and the ones that the accounts that the anthropologists and folklorists and people thought were the best, uh, most interesting. They went out and interviewed the people themselves or the kids, again, carefully. And in some cases, they took 
Edison cylinders to record them. So there's actually audio recordings of some of these. Uh, so we went there, my wife Charlotte and I, we decided to do some field research in Ireland. Where else would you go for fairies? And um, some of the papers had to be uh, translated from Gaelic. They were really old root. I didn't want the pretty fairies from uh, Victorian or uh, Edwardian type context. I wanted the real law. And it was more difficult than you could think uh, because a lot of people just casually talk about a fairy path, won't give any information about it. Where the hell did it run? From or to? Or how was it known? How was it marked? Anyway, we got together a, a set of uh, potentials and we were set out on our field work over a few different seasons. Uh, and we were accompanied, uh, I have to say, and guided in some cases, uh, by this chap, Eddie Lenahan, who is a, a famous Irish storyteller. And more than that, he's a folklorist. He also has been talking to people for the last 30 years, old people who are now dead, uh, recording their fairy lore, what they knew. And he, uh, uh, first of all, audio recorded them, later uh, video recorded them. He's got a huge body of law, which he plunders every so often for his books. But it's, uh, it's wonderful. Anyway, we'll meet Eddie again shortly. This is um, one of Eddie's, actually. He took us to this. This, uh, <coughs> this is now a cattle shed, knocking cream, uh, but it uh, was a croft. And back in the 1980s, Eddie talked to the last inhabitant, old man, uh, who told him of an account he had, because he was losing cattle. His cattle were dying, not very well, a bit poorly. Uh, and one day an itinerant tinker came by to show up and scythe and whatever. Uh, and uh, the old guy said to the tinker, you know, I've got this trouble. And the tinker said, oh, well, that, that's understandable. You know why? And the guy said, no, why? And uh, he said, well, you're on a ferry path that runs between two hills and you're right on the way. And so he looked at the map and sure enough, uh, hill, hill, knocking cream. Also, I should say, there's a straight track leading up to the, uh, to the house, uh, which would be bad news if you were in old China. It would be bad feng shui. Uh, anyway, the guy said, well, what the hell can I do? So the tinker said, well, you've got a door. That's your front door. Have you got a back door? He said, yeah, opposite, actually. He said, at night, leave your doors slightly open so the fairies can go through and they won't bother you anymore and they won't cause problems with your cattle. And the guy told Eddie that, well, I was true. I didn't have any more problems. He just had a bloody drafty house. <laughs> okay, now, this is a true fairy story and this is all uh, down to Eddie, this one. Uh, this is the Latoon fairy uh, bush, Hawthorne, of course, uh, pictured in happier times. Then one day, they decided to run a modern big road through uh, along the west coast, went through the site of this tree on its way to Ennis. Uh, and you can see there, circled, look how it's surrounded, look how we changed the shape of the land. We changed the topography these days. We hardly notice. Uh, anyway, there it was. And he said, oh, look, it, this, is, uh, this is, you know, it's tradition. It should be preserved. People said, ah, don't bother. Old Ireland, that is. So Eddie had his brainwave of writing to, I think it was the New York Times. Anyway, yeah, New York Times. And he said this tree, this famous tree where trooping fairies would rest and gather and chit-chat and carry on their, their march. Red jacket, green jacket, marching together. Uh, and he said, it's going to go, and it's going to be destroyed. 
And it was such a furore uh, from Americans who like to fancy their ancestry goes back to Ireland. And um, the uh, engineers said, OK, we'll bend the road a bit around the fairy tree, which they did. I keep hitting the wrong one here. And there you are, you see the road bending around. And they put a fence around it to protect it. That's the happy ending. The less happy ending is uh, one August night, somebody went out to the tree, out to the bush, and hacked it to bits. Because there's a lot of people in Ireland don't like this old Irish stuff, the fairies. We're a modern country, uh, they say. Uh, fortunately, uh, Eddie found that the sap was still rising, so the tree has survived. But it went through a nasty attack. OK, rolling on. That's just a few examples of, of fairy paths. I've got to tell you, it's not easy doing folklore, field folklore, on the topic of fairies, at least in this country, in, in, in England, uh, because uh, it's, a, it's a verboten subject. It's just fairy tales, you know, Disney. And anybody who believes in them are half-cracked. Uh, so uh, I do advise doing it in Ireland because it's another story in Ireland. I remember I began to realise this. <laughs> we were looking. We went to, with our field work. We went up to this little uh, hamlet where we knew on our UCD records there should have been a fairy path, and it went through Billy somebody's house, and we couldn't. Uh, find it. So very reluctantly, I went up to this house, and you don't do this lightly, and I knock on the door, and this big burly Irishman came to the door. I thought, oh, bloody hell. I thought, well, look, uh, we're researching a fairy path. <laughs> and I expected to be swiped straight away, uh, but no, 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 you that was my Irish accent. Um, they, um, they said, no, yes, we, we know about it. Now, this document we had referred to a, an account. It must be 70, 90 years old. Uh, and he said, yeah, we know. And that was on Billy Sanso's house. And he, he was in the way. And he had to shorten the house and do all the sorts of things uh, that you do if you're on a fairy path. And so we were able to trace it. He knew where it went on to. But after that, he didn't know anymore. And we talked to people. At times, we had you know, little communities out trying to find the path for us. And we couldn't find a lot of them. They were beyond recall, but we did quite a few. But you know, you'd go and talk to people. Eddie would introduce us to people in remote farmsteads. And they'd bring out the best china, sit down. And uh, it was beautiful. Brought a tear to the eye. Uh, and you weren't considered a lunatic. I wouldn't try it here. <laughs> uh, anyway. So, that's, that's some of the ways through the landscape the spirits of various denominations travelled. Uh, but sometimes folklore bites back. And it's not folklore anymore. It's an actual experience. And we got a hint of this during, during the research we were doing, people, a lot of people would just give you a generic folk tale of their area. Yeah, okay. But some people talking about memory. They said, oh, no, no, I, I walked into these people, these, these other, the other crowd, and they were, um, uh, they weren't human. They were different, and they might jostle you. And, uh, and so they talked as though it was an actual experience. Then we follow this very ancient account of a fairy path that led from, led from a, a rath down, across, through a crossroads and on. And nobody would know about this unless they'd done some detailed research, as we had. It's not in the books or anything. 
and it happened to clip the edge of a cottage. Uh, and we found the cottage. It was you know, following the line. We are doing it properly, compasses and all the rest. Uh, and there was a guy building a modern extension to one side of the... Uh, uh, extending the uh, cottage. But the old part was still there. And again, it was one of these things. Mm, do you know you're on a fairy path? <laughs> you're kidding. He said, uh, no. I said, it happens to go through that end of your... Uh, the old part of the cottage. And he said, well, it's funny you should say that because my wife had a funny experience there. But she was ill and we're now separated. So we said, well, where is your wife in the area? He said, yeah, and he gave her her dress to us. And we went over and <sighs> met her and talked to her. She said, oh, yeah. She said, I wasn't feeling very well. And I went into the, the lounge uh, at the, uh, that was in the old part of the uh, cottage. And she said, um, I was sitting there and these small figures came in. They faded in through the wall, crossed the room, took no notice of me. She said, they're only short and faded out through the other wall. <coughs> Those figures would have been on this, absolutely on this fairy path. So, okay... Uh, was she hallucinating? I don't know. But let's talk about... We just got a feeling there was more to it than just generic folklore. And I'd bring that to the attention of academic folklorists. So, beyond folklore, when folklore bites back... Two, two couple of quick examples. I wrote this book in 2001. Another book you should read... Uh, if you can find it, um, where I looked at all sorts of uh, ghostly happenings on the landscape. Uh, and in particular, I looked at road ghosts, modern accounts, and slightly older accounts of ghosts seen on the road. And it's just a fact that some stretches of road have multiple sightings of ghosts, ghostly visions of one sort or another, when the roads all around don't. And some of these accounts span 20 years or more. People report them. An example, an example is this one here. Uh, this is a haunted road near Froome in Somerset where your traditional uh, ghostly hitchhiker case occurred. This person stopped with this person who got in the car, who didn't say a lot, uh, and who's driving along here, and suddenly he'd realise that person wasn't there anymore. People say, oh, that's, you know, sort of American movie stuff. <coughs> Actually, the first phantom hitchhiker we know of occurred in the 8th century in Scandinavia. There it wasn't a car, it was a sleigh they got on, but anyway. Um, he reported it, to the police and said, you know, I, I don't know where he went. He didn't seem to open the door, you know. Uh, so the police, oh, well, you know, we have a number of reports from that stretch of road. Uh, and some other people have reported seeing figures running across the road or standing and disappearing in front of them and people have to report them. Uh, the interesting thing about this road, it runs through landscape where the field names tell you of haunting, of puck, of, of, of spirits, of the wild, the wild. Here's another one. Uh, this is uh, a road that runs, a very old road, some sort of ridgeway, that runs near the little Cotswold village of Norton. And Norton's down in the Vale, and this is high up. And this chap is Guy Ralph, and he's a, an anaesthetist. Uh, and he was, uh, had been working in a, a, a local, this is when we had local hospitals. Uh, and he uh, was driving home late, well, it was still light, uh, August, one August evening. And as he came to this stretch of road, he was driving that way. Uh, he saw this woman standing by the road and she had a strange half smile on her face looking at him 
and she just went like this with her hand. So he pulled up afterwards. He thought, is she stranded out here? I didn't see another car. Just before he got out, his car filled up with the smell of burning wood, a lovely pine smell. And whew, somebody's burning a fire near here. He gets out, no smell outside at all. Looks back, no sign of the woman. He goes back to this spot here, he's marking it. Uh, looks everywhere, over the little wall, looks around, no sign of her. Uh, now, that was interesting. What's also interesting, that stretch of road has had numerous reports. One was uh, people, three or four, I don't know how many, three or four people in a car driving this way, and suddenly the engine cuts out. And they're sitting there, thinking, what happened? And they all had the sensation as if water was creeping up their legs, up to their knees. There's no water there, but they could feel it. And then it went. Now, I mark this out because sometimes sightings of, uh, of ghosts, and particularly road ghosts, are associated with sensory, what we would call sensory hallucinations. Uh, and I just think that's somehow significant. Anyway, we couldn't find anything special about this area. That was another example of a haunted road. Now, back to that lovely book. Um, when, as I was saying, you know, we we found got hints that the uh, there was more to it than simple stories and generic folklore as we went around Ireland. And the west of Ireland is the place. Uh, A.E. Russell used to say he had his best visions on the west coast of Ireland. It's, it's full of atmosphere, full of ancient sites, Neolithic sites. Anyway, um, we uh, had this sense there was more to it. Then one day, now, Please take note. I'm not going to stand here. Oh, I'm not going to stand here and lie to you. I'm not lying. I'm not completely demented. But Charlotte and I were driving along uh, this country road from traveling to our next place to check out or from our UCD data. And the road comes up and splits into a Y crossroads, junction, a wide junction. Of course, being rural island, there's not always signposts, and we didn't know which way to go. It was an overcast mid-afternoon, uh, and so the, we, stopped the, we didn't stop the car, we reduced it to a walking pace, on left or right. In between the two arms, it's just level grass, you know, ordinary grass. Started to just start onto the right-hand fork, and suddenly, it wasn't there before, was this figure, about uh, two or three feet tall. And it, it, was a, it was anthropomorphic. It had a head, shoulders, uh, and but we, uh, neither of us could see arms or legs. It was standing there a bit like a bollard, but it had a head and shoulders. And it was composed of a... Of a complex, dark, multi-toned green all over, all over. No face or anything. Uh, and uh, it looked like foliage, but I can guarantee it was, but it was like that. Uh, and deep set into that head with very dark eyes. And we crept around and go, <laughs> bloody hell, you know. Uh, and it started to turn its head at us, it saw us. And we sure as hell were seeing it. Uh, but we're talking about something that lasted perhaps 30 seconds. It really was fleeting but objective. And this thing was three-dimensional because as we were going like this, we were seeing around it. It was as solid as could be. It was an objective phenomenon, but it was very transient. And I'll admit, I lost my call. I was 
ontologically discombobulated. <laughs> and I put my foot down and shot off. And I should have stayed. I kicked myself to this day. This was around about the year 2000, while we were researching for the Fairy Path book. Uh, there's nowhere to go with your theorizing when you see something like this, when it confronts you. It's there, and it's not folklore. The thing may be of folklore, it may be, I mean, this thing was the green man, I guess, uh, but it freaked the hell out of me, and I couldn't, and I was ready for this sort of stuff, uh, but, you know. So, that's not a photograph of it, but uh, <laughs> I, I only wish it was uh, really before you carried around mobile phones. And even then, I think I'd have been too paralyzed to photograph it, and it was too quick. Uh, so these things do exist. And so, if, incidentally, if you want a, uh, uh, a full written account, I've actually committed it to paper in this book, in the foreword to this book. Uh, and you should get that, and you can get it from my website there. Uh, which is about to change into a new website that you would still get through. Uh, or you can get it online if you want to support Amazon. If you want to support your independent researcher, you can get it from that uh, address. Look, uh, this underneath it all, uh, this is serious. It's time, I think, folklore. Academic folklore is fine. And looking for the sociological reasons for this, that, and the other, social history, and so on perfectly valid, because folklore as a body is, not, is based on those sort of things, tensions of the times or whatever. But there's something in the heart of it. There's some little grit in the pearl of folklore that should be examined. Now, we have a beautiful folklorist at the back here, and he's told me, he said, well, it's got to be something that my science and my scholarship can understand. Well, no. You have to build a, you know, a big telescope, put it in orbit around the Earth to see the far as st furthest stars. You have to adapt your discipline to try and find out what the hell these things are, because I want to know before I put my clogs. Uh, th they are real. And also, at the present time, with the rise of, what shall I say, eco-awareness, uh, of, of uh, climate change and so on, these things have suddenly taken on another dimension of significance, I think. We share the planet with other entities. And I think they keep well away uh, from us. Uh, they are a very, very rare and shy fauna, if you like, uh, with very unusual attributes. And they um, have gone, I think, to Ireland largely because it's the perimeter of this big heaving continental mass of humanity. They still exist in deep forests and waterfalls and various parts of, of, of Europe and Asia. So I think we need to uh, think about this. Uh, we belong to something... I'm the director of something called the Dragon Project. And we've twiddled our thumbs. How could this be researched? We will have to keep twiddling our thumbs. There needs to be serious research. These things do really exist. And the green man, if that's what it was, it's not some medieval thing carved on the end of a pew. It goes back at least to 200 BC perfect examples. Uh, it's, it's an archetype. And, and, and this is something I've, I've thought about. I'm just finishing up now. Uh, it's something I've thought about when I was doing the uh, Haunted Land book. Some of these road ghosts were like archetypes. They weren't quite... They were objective events, but they were archetypal in nature. And somehow, is there some mechanism on Earth? You see, I noticed we were traveling around looking for fairy paths. 
and we saw one. Did it know we were doing that? Were, were we prepared for it? Uh, I know somebody else. Uh, well, he, uh, Peter Brooks Smith, he doesn't mind being named. He was pretty tough. He is not your shrinking violet in any way. Uh, and he uh, saw uh, a little thing in, uh, in a valley in Ireland. And I said, well, what did it look like? He said, it was sitting on a log and it looked like a leprechaun. I said, oh, come on, are you putting me on? He said, no, no, it looked like a leprechaun. It was he said, I passed it, I went back and it was gone. Uh, Glenda Locke, replete with fairies. Uh, and other people I know who have seen, seen them. And, and, and Richard was, was talking about them as well. Real people see real phenomena and they are, would be grouped into the area of fairies and fairy law. It's not all law. But it's the basis of law. Or at least it gets mixed in with generic folklore. Okay, folks, thank you for coming. <laughs> Wonderful afternoon. Wonderful day. Thank you.